Welcome everybody to, to today's program. This is going to be the first of several forums on the AFL-CIO Foreign Operations being brought to you by LAPAIO. LAPAIO stands for Labor Education Project on the AFL-CIO's International Operations. We're a number of people from across uh, North America, most mostly uh, Americans. We've got at least a couple of Canadians in, working with us. Uh, most of us are trade unionists, a few are not. Um, my name is Kim Sipes. I'm a um, former trade union. I, well, I am a trade unionist. I've been, I, I came out of the skilled trades. I was a printer for a number of years. I've, I've done everything from act as uh, flyboy on, a, on web presses up to printing, uh, running print, printing presses themselves. I did that for a number of years. And then uh, years later, after getting screwed over, um, I decided to go back to academia and eventually got my PhD at age 51. Um, so uh, I just retired of, of, after teaching at Purdue University Northwest in Northwest Indiana. Um, I will be op uh, acting as the operator, to, uh, as the moderator today, excuse me. Um, we've got a quite an interesting program. I'm going to talk a little bit about LaPaio to give a little brief overview. Then I'm going to give it to Frank Hammer, uh, who will introduce Rob McKenzie, our, our main speaker today. Afterwards, we hope to be able to, uh, we, we plan on having questions and answers. We're looking forward to an interesting conversation. All right, like I said, today is the first of several panels on the AFL-CIO operations around the world. A lot of people do not know this, but the AFL-CIO has been operating internationally for the last hundred years. They've kept this under their hats. This is generally unknown to a lot of people. Some of us know. Um, and we're going to focus on, on uh, Mexico today. Um, we're hoping to have, we're planning to have another seminar in May, which we will announce later. Okay, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Frank Hammer. Uh, Frank is a retired Detroit production and skilled trades worker, uh, comes out of UAW uh, Local 909. Uh, he was the bargaining unit, uh, chair of the bargaining unit, the vice president and president between 1982 and 1994. So um, if you would all, any of you uh, who would like it, uh, want to identify yourself, particularly if you're a UAW member and you're local or your location, that would be great if you could put that up. Uh, Frank is going to uh, Frank is going to introduce Rob McKenzie so we can get to the heart of the matter today. And then, like I say, after Rob talks, uh, and we're going to see a video in here, uh, after after uh, Rob finishes, I'll come back and we'll have a Q&A session. So anybody that wants to ask questions will be able to. We'll, we'll, uh, we, we will uh, open this up and hopefully, like I say, have a good conversation. We're planning overall for the for the um, whole program to take about an hour and a half. So thank you each for being here. Uh, Victoria, I see you have a, a hand up. Is there a question before we get started? Well, I'm not, not hearing anyway. All right, so Frank, if you would go ahead, please, sir. Great. Thank you, Kim. And thank you for all of you making your time to tune in to this uh, event about a book, a very, a very important book written by Rob McKenzie. I have a couple of comments to make about the context, which I think is important. And this is why we're doing what we're doing now. Uh, we stand at a pivotal mo moment in the, the UAW. Last year saw big changes that shook the union's foundations, made possible by the membership voting for the direct election of the national leadership. The reformed challengers, UAW Members United, swept all the positions which they ran for. The UAW Executive Board is now split evenly seven and seven, but the reformers have the majority of the votes. 
They are now tasked with reforming the UAW by implementing new goals, new organization, and we're here to help, and new processes. There's much about our union that's been kept a secret on the grounds that revealing those secrets would advantage our enemies. Unfortunately, that argument has been abused by the ruling caucus to shield itself from accountability. Nowhere is this more evident than in our union, UAW's foreign policy, which has by and large been wedded to that of the AFL-CIO and by extension to the Democratic Party. This deserves a fresh look. Rob McKenzie is very timely with the 2022 publication of his book, El Golpe, just in time for the changes in our union that we're seeing and being or being part of. Today, there's an upsurge among workers in Mexico's auto industry against the multinational corporations and the corrupt union bureaucrats that protect them. It also comes at a time when there's a growing desire in the UAW's ranks led by the reform group UAWD to build solidarity with our brothers and sisters south of the border that will be mutually beneficial. We witnessed that solidarity materialize in 2019 during our UAW's 40-day strike against GM. Rank-and-file truck builders in GM in Mexico resisted the company's speed-up and forced overtime aimed at weakening the UAW strikers in the U.S. Some were fired as a result. In 2022, these workers kicked out the old guard formed their own union and negotiated a contract ratified by the workers. Rob's book takes us further back to 1990 to a courageous fight by auto workers at a Ford plant just outside Mexico's capital. It was a precursor to what we're seeing today. As you will learn from Brother McKenzie, his fellow Ford workers mounted a solidarity offensive, which we can learn from, including the ways it was undermined by the UAW and CIO. The book doesn't confine itself to Mexico. There are other chapters about Chile, about El Salvador, which includes uh, some mentions about my brother, and that will be a subject for another day. Today, we're talking about Mexico. An introduction to Rob McKenzie. After graduating from the University of Iowa with a BA degree, Bob McKenzie went to work in Midwestern factories with an eye to organizing. He hired in at the Twin Cities Ford Assembly Plant in St. Paul, Minnesota, home of UAW Local 879 in 1978, and worked there for 28 years as an assembler and electrician. In 1998, he was elected local president and served three terms until 2006 when his plant closed. There's more to tell. But it gives you a flavor. He's done research about the incident in Mexico and can reflect on the movement in his own plant in solidarity. Please welcome Rob McKenzie. Thank you. And I see a text here, a message from Victoria Hamlin that she could not unmute. So if uh, Kim, if you can unmute her, if she had a question, maybe she can ask it now. I was I was gonna uh, wait till wait till after Rob's talk to take okay. this question. So Fair I'm enough. on top of that, Frank. Fair enough. Okay. okay, Rob. Okay. Well, Frank, Kim, thanks for having me today. Um, I want to apologize in advance for my Spanish. I'm sure to butcher some pronunciations, so please bear with me. I also want to try to do something a little different today than I've done in Zooms and podcasts previously. And that is, I want to focus on the support work my local union did for the Ford Workers Democratic Movement in the early 1990s. And then after this short film, which really documents quite a bit of that, I want to talk about the intransience of the AFL-CIO, its affiliates, and refusing to acknowledge what actually happened there at Ford Quetitlan, and also their general refusal to discuss the role of the CIA and labor during the Cold War. So I wanna get into that after the film. Now, for this to make sense, I need to talk just a little bit about what happened in Mexico. Now I have four chapters on the book on that. 
So what I'm doing here is barely scratching the surface. I'm hoping to give you enough that the solidarity efforts make sense. In January 8, 1990, about 300 armed thugs, which I'll call golpeadores, entered the Ford assembly plant just north of Mexico City. So they were there when the workers reported for work in the morning. They began intimidating them, threatening them. The workers, many of them were prepared for this and fought back and started to drive the, the golpeadores out. They opened fire shooting nine and one of them died. In response to that, the workers occupied the plant and they held it for 15 days until on January 22nd, they were driven out by 2000 police. And once that happened, they went on strike. They set up an encampment in front of the plant and continued the strike. After a few weeks, Ford got the government to ditch the contract. Ford and the CTM sent out letters to all the workers telling them if they did not report for work, they would be fired. And people started slowly trickling back. Uh, the, they didn't get very many back, and the ones they got back weren't doing much work. At the end of March of 1990, the Ford CFO came in to Mexico City from Detroit, and they signed an agreement with the local union, a CTM local union, ending the strike. Now, they didn't get much. They didn't get the demands of the occup occupation. They didn't get any agreement to hire everybody back, but they were really in a weak position. So the strike continued, really. In April, the workers who had not received a re notice to return to work, about 600 of them tried to physically re-enter the building, and they were blocked by 1,500 police. Um, in June, they did a nude-in. Um, the ones who hadn't been rehired went to the Department of Mediation and Conciliation office and took off their clothes, symbolically making the statement they were totally without protection from the CTM. And if you look at the, I got the embassy cables about this, Ford was not able to get production up and running, even up to June. And they finally settled with these 600 people they fired and gave them severance pay. And at that point, the next big hope for this movement was to switch labor confederations from the government affiliated CTM to another um, approved labor federation. And at that point, they really began reaching out internationally to try to get support. And so that's when my local really got deeply involved. Now, the first written record I found for my local was an article in our local union newspaper. And I wanna read what I put in the book that was in the local union newspaper. The May 1990 issue of the 879 Auto Worker, the newsletter of UAW 879 at the Twin Cities Assembly reported that Marco Antonio Jimenez, a newly elected leader of the Ford Quetitlan Assembly Plant said workers at the plant were attacked by thugs in Ford uniforms with Ford ID badges in January. The attack resulted in a 15 day occupation of the plant by 2000 workers. Jimenez went on to say that there was no union hall. They needed hundreds of people to attend union meetings. Now I need to say there was an election in May. All the activists in our local were running for office, including me. I ran for president and lost in a very close election the guy who did get elected was willing to participate and support work for Mexico as long as I wasn't involved. So the things I'm reporting on, I was an observer, I was on the executive board, but I wasn't a direct participant. So I wanted to make that clear. In December of 1990, there was a big award ceremony at the Ford Twin Cities plant. Um, it was a big board, all workers got off the job to go attend this meeting. It was covered by the local press. And at that meeting, the local building chairman who spoke referenced what had happened in Mexico and said, there's blood on the floor in that plant in Mexico. And this is with the local press. So that got a great deal of attention in our local and in the community, really. Um, uh, next big thing we did was organize a Ford workers, Cleto Nemo, Ford Workers Justice Day. Day. Cleto Nemo was the guy who died in the gunfire on the January 8th attack. So we had planned to have everybody in the plant wear armbands. So I saved mine. I still have mine that I wore that day. So I can, can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Upside, down. upside down. So yeah, I, here it says, uh, 
Credo on one side, and that was Credo Nemo. On the other side, it says AMC. So we threw apartheid into this. And we made about 350 of these because we weren't sure how many people would wear them. Uh, almost everybody in the day shift wore them. And so it was a big success in the film that we're going to be showing. You can see a guy with a ribbon on. Not everybody had the armband. Some people had rib ribbons. Um, and that February, we were able to bring two workers up from the Ford plant. They were able to get into the country after a big tussle with the State Department. They finally came up and um, we had a free trade conference at McAllister Co College, which they spoke at. And they also met with US Senator Paul Wellstone, who had just been elected. And so I've got a picture that I keep in my desk. So if you can see this, on the right is Santos Martinez. On the left is Raul Escobar Briones. Um, Escobar had been the financial secretary and had been fired in June of 1989. Um, he was uh, gonna run for a national position in the CTM and likely was gonna win. And Ford fired four people right before this election. And that's really what kicked off a lot of the events. Um, that spring, uh, some people visited the plant and that's in the video. They're both interviewed in the video. So you'll be able to see that. The summer, our local was able to get the UAW Ford Sum Council too, which is a National Bargaining Council of Ford Assembly Plants to host the, the workers from Mexico, give them a chance to address the group. And so that happened that summer too. Uh, you know, I talked to our chairman who organized that, and he remembers a local in Kansas City, 249, as being very involved in that. And a chairman of the Louisville Assembly Plant named Ron Gettelfinger, who backed that happening. So and the last thing I wanted to talk about, oh, no, there's a couple of things. The, the October, there was a Minnesota State AFL-CIO convention, and we were able to get Brionis to speak at that. So Rod Hayworth, who's on here, was our delegate at that. Uh, it was not, I'm talking about it, it was not that easy getting them on the podium. It was not, um, the president of the state fed was not that thrilled with it, was our impression of that. So he spoke there. And I also, I want to read what he said at that meeting. At, at, he, this is quoted in the labor press as what he said at that AFL-CIO convention. And this is concerning uh, the free trade agreement. Uh, October 1991, Raul Escobar Briones came to Minnesota and addressed the Minnesota State AFL-CIO convention. He declared that Mexican authorities and government influence unions were eager to collaborate with foreign corporations and support the agreement proposed NAFTA is what we're talking about there to demonstrate that Mexico will supply cheap and cooperative labor. Escobar urged delegates to work in solidarity with Mexican and Canadian workers because we're all affected by the free trade agreement, he said. He said, Mexican workers have little hope for change without legal reforms in Mexico, and without international coordination by unions to defend labor gains in the face of the global marketplace. Well, I think time has proven what he said was exactly right. And this was year, three years before NAFTA went into effect. Uh, there have been some significant legal changes in Mexico, and we have the rise of the independent unions down there. But something that still needs more work is this international labor coordination and international worker solidarity and part of American workers and American unions. So with that, uh, I think we can show the movie. para las 7 nos empezaron a balasear, nos empezaron a balasear ahí enfrente de, de la puerta principal. Nomás veía uno cómo caían los compañeros, o sea, nos disparaban como si, como si nada, o sea, como, 
tú mismo veías como caía tu compañero a, al lado tuyo, ¿no? Entonces, lo que hicimos fue escondernos con ellos. El día de hoy nos acompañan miembros del Comité Ejecutivo de la Labor en Minnesota y miembros del Comité Ejecutivo de la Labor en Kansas City. Los compañeros han venido a solidarizarse con el Movimiento Democrático de la Labor. We came down uh, now to get a first-hand look of what's going down here and find out how we can develop a stronger, more solid solidarity with our Mexican workers. The next question was, why do we want to support the Mexican workers? And I told them, if we don't support them, then who knows, maybe in time we might be going through the same conditions they are with the uh, conditions they have to work under. Cuando el compañero murió, nos unimos todos y juntamos nuestras manos y nosotros dijimos desde ese día que las manos que Cleto unió no se separarán jamás. Hemos ido a extender esas manos que Cleto unió más allá de las fronteras. Eh, a Estados Unidos, a Canadá, a Brasil, nuestras manos como trabajadores es lo único que tenemos. For the big corporations, crossing into Mexico is like going back in time. As this business association video put it, Your company can bring raw materials or components into Mexico, where they can be assembled by one of the lowest cost labor forces in the world. The minimum hourly rate is somewhere in the neighborhood of 55 cents per, per hour of direct labor today. That's typically about what's been running for the past two years. Mexican wages and benefits are more than three times lower than Hong Kong and Korea, almost four times less than what they are in Taiwan, and 20 times less costly than in the United States. The number of U.S. plants in Mexico has more than tripled in the past 10 years. On the average, a new one opens every business day. Mexican workers for most of America's biggest companies make every conceivable product to sell back in the United States. The savings in labor costs goes not to lower consumer prices, but to raise corporate profits. A decade of increased U.S. operations has meant more poverty for Mexican communities. To please the big U.S. and Mexican companies, the government has imposed wage controls, helping to reduce the basic wage from about $7 per day in 1982 to less than $4 per day now. Most workers can only afford one or two room shacks shared by six to ten people, usually without plumbing, electricity, or telephone. On $4 a day, the few people who find jobs with U.S. companies don't have enough money to support local businesses and create jobs for other people. In fact, with prices for most goods similar to those in the U.S., workers generally cannot even buy the products they make. Families and communities are torn apart as workers seeking a living wage must immigrate to the United States. The companies often dump toxic waste on nearby land and into the water supply and ignore basic standards for health and safety on the job. El ruido rebasa los 110 decibeles. Esto ha producido bastantes hipocusias a todos los trabajadores. Con lo que refiere al calor, también las condiciones son muy detrimentes, ya que rebasa hasta los 30 o 40 grados, sin que se les permita siquiera ir al baño a tomar agua. La rapidez con que avanzan las unidades eh, pone en riesgo eh, a los trabajadores. La mayoría de los trabajadores de esta área no recurren a los servicios médicos por, eh, pues porque todas las salidas al médico, eh, los reportes de este tipo de, de cosas de la salud, eh, pues provocan que haya eh, represión. For years, workers at Ford's Cuauhtitlan plant have protested poor working conditions, pay cuts, and the firing of elected local union leaders. Yet the National Labor Federation, the CTM, has supported the company's actions. The CTM is not an independent union organization, but an official arm of Mexico's ruling political party. 
it provides professional thugs to attack workers who resist exploitation by their employers. The Ford workers decided that, beginning January 8, 1990, they would report for work but stand idle by their machines until the company and CTM respected their rights. But CTM buses brought in hundreds of armed men to put down this protest. Nos ponían el arma en la cabeza y nos decían que nos dedicáramos a trabajar y que nos dejáramos de andar de sindicalistas. Eh, al ver que golpeaban a un joven compañero de trabajo, este, despiadadamente por seis personas desconocidas, ajenas al, a las instalaciones, este, les pregunté por qué lo golpean, llegó una persona que dijo ser coordinador de Héctor Uriarte y le dijeron este que dice ese también hay que golpearlo y nos empezaron a disparar hubo infinidad de heridos todos corrimos nos protegimos inclusive yo estuve protegido tras una palmera porque los balazos me pasaban muy cerca me silbaban cerca los balazos vi, vi caer a varios compañeros heridos en los pies en, en, un, en, en un hombro inclusive Un compañero, Cleto Nigmo, que cayó herido en, con una bala en el estómago, en el abdomen, que posteriormente no se pudo recuperar y desgraciadamente falleció. A few of the intruders were captured by workers and turned over to the news media for questioning, still wearing the Ford uniforms they had been provided. Workers later obtained Mexican Social Security records showing that many of the gunmen were hired by Ford just two days before the attack. Estas personas, por ejemplo, fueron de alta, fueron dado de alta el 6 de enero del 90 y los dio de baja la empresa el 2 de febrero del 90 después de que cumplieron su cometido. For months, the Ford workers took their case to the company and the Mexican government, but it was the victims of the attack who were punished. About 800 members of the Ford Workers' Democratic Movement were fired, while the officials who ordered the attack were never charged. I am surprised that you would uh, conclude that Ford management would provide uniforms to non-employees of Ford Motor Company. Management was not involved, they were not employees of the company, and management assisted in no way. Protests spread across three countries as Ford workers in Mexico, the United States and Canada wore black armbands on the same day to commemorate the murder of Cleto Nino. There was almost 100% participation, which not only showed support, but it gave our workers an understanding of the struggle that was going on down in Mexico. Outside the Mexican plant, workers joined in a prayer service with Cleto Nigno's family. Under pressure at home and abroad, the Mexican government was forced to let the Ford workers vote on whether to switch from the CTM to another union. Thousands of police were sent to stop workers from giving leaflets to others arriving on buses and to stand guard as workers voted not by secret ballot, but out loud in front of company supervisors. Workers were threatened with firing if they didn't vote for the company's choice. More than a thousand workers put their jobs on the line by voting for democratic change. But massive fraud put the CTM ahead by 200 votes. Que más de 500 trabajadores de la Ford no se les permitió votar. Hubo una serie de gentes que sin ser trabajadores eh, con credenciales falsas se les permitió votar. Pero me parece de todos modos una jornada muy digna porque fueron 1110 trabajadores que a pesar de todas las presiones emitieron su voto en contra de la CTM por un sindicalismo diferente. In recent years, there have been many democratic movements in Mexico by the workers who make Corona and Modelo beer, by clothing and textile workers, healthcare employees, airline workers, nuclear and oil workers, farm workers and family farmers, miners and steel workers, rubber workers, 
and public workers such as university employees and school teachers. While big corporations siphon off Mexico's wealth, they use their power to avoid paying the taxes needed for education and other public services. For teachers, that means salaries of only $70 per week, classrooms with 40 to 80 students, and few materials to work with. In recent years, strikes by as many as half a million education workers have forced the government to grant some small raises and to replace a few leaders of the government-controlled teachers' union. Teachers are also challenging plans to change what is taught in the schools. They say the government is not really trying to improve education quality, but to provide obedient, cheap labor for the transnational corporations. In the past decade, more than a hundred Mexican teachers have been killed for opposing government policies. In the eyes of millions of teachers and other citizens, democratic change requires a complete overhaul of Mexico's political system. One party, the PRI, has been in power for more than 60 years. President Carlos Salinas's party hands out money in certain communities in return for political support. And when necessary, elections are simply stolen. Observers are often physically thrown out before the votes are counted. Many workers are required to go to the polls to vote for the PRI or lose their jobs. Poor people are paid to be taken from precinct to precinct to vote repeatedly, and dead people are given ballots while certain live ones can't seem to qualify. In 1988, an opposition leader, Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas, appeared to be defeating Salinas for the Mexican presidency as returns poured in. But PRI leaders control the nation's election commission, and they claimed that the computers had broken down. A week later, Carlos Salinas declared himself the winner, although the votes for many precincts were never made available. When working people protest election fraud and economic policies that benefit the rich, the PRI responds with violence. Yet citizens in dozens of communities have had the courage to physically take over town halls when PRI officials refused to admit defeat in local elections. Many Mexicans have also sought to promote democratic change by building international alliances with working people in the United States, Canada, and other countries. Workers have taken part in conferences and visits to each other's communities. They've discussed the corporation's program known as free trade or economic integration, which forces countries to compete on the basis of which has the lowest wages, environmental standards, and social programs. Because that's a competition in which all workers lose, they've argued that real prosperity and security will come only when labor standards, environmental protection, public services, and political rights are brought up everywhere to the highest possible level. Nosotros pensamos que en primer término quienes se beneficiarán con este tratado de libre comercio son las empresas transnacionales 
que quieren seguir manteniendo el control por sobre los trabajadores a toda costa. Lo que nos ha traído todo este proceso de integración económica ha sido recortes en los contratos colectivos, este, eh, topes salariales, eh, intensidad en, en los ritmos de trabajo, eh, descuidos sociales en, en el trabajo y en, en el conjunto de la población. Un país más grandote, donde haya una libertad de comercio, pero no haya una libertad para poder eh, tener acceso a este mercado por los bajos salarios. Workers in Canada, where free trade with the United States was enacted in 1989, say they are now having to defend their national health care system, which provides affordable quality coverage to every citizen. Multinational corporations argue that because the system is overseen by the government, it interferes with free competition. A Medicare system that's second to none. Uh, I'm talking about our, our pension programs, our Canada-wide pension programs. You're going to see them, in my opinion, absolutely uh, destroyed in the long term. And I believe that's a part of the right-wing agenda. And we all know what that means. Uh, uh, if you have, you get. If you don't have, too bad. For Americans, continued low wages in countries like Mexico mean job losses and pay cuts in U.S. industry, which in turn means less money to support workers in the service and public sectors. I got transferred from Lima Engine Plant because of uh, economic distress. They sent the work out somewhere else. They sent the work to uh, Mexico. Some of it went to Brazil. So I've been there, and I know when you're talking about a job and you're unemployed. We don't want to see Ford closing their factories in Mexico, but what we want to see Ford is to pay a uh, high enough wage so the products that are being built by the workers, that those same workers can afford those products. That way, the competitive edge that Ford now uses as pitting the U.S. workers to the Mexican workers would not be there. But the wages they pay them, they can't possibly maintain a family. That's all we ask. If everyone could come down here and just see the banners and listen to these people, they would try and understand that the Mexican worker is not taking their job. It's Ford Motor Company. Los objetivos son comunes eh, porque nosotros también luchamos por tener un empleo, por tener mejores condiciones de trabajo, por tener como decimos una vida digna. A donde quiera que estemos, a donde quiera que vayamos, vamos a extender esas manos para que las agarren otros compañeros y luchen con nosotros y nosotros con ellos. Yeah, that film really touched on a lot of what was going on there. And I thought really for the time it was made, really did a good job. It uh, Part of it was about the election between the two labor federations, the CTM, and the other was CORE, or Confederation of Revolutionary Workers. The, the, when, when the trouble started, the members at the CTM local at Quatitlan voted to leave the CTM and join CORE. So the government organized an election. That was the election that took place in June. And we sent two people down as observers, massively fraudulent election. Um, I have an embassy cable that uh, John Negroponte, who was the ambassador at the time sent, which was really a whitewash of that election. So, but after that defeat, as far as we could tell, the, the, the struggle really started fading back. They had really taken on some powerful forces, the government, the government union, um, Ford, and I, I'm quite certain the CIA was behind the attack on the plant. And that's really what a lot of the book is about. Now, 
1996, I was at a meeting at the Coalition for Justice in the McKeel Doors uh, on the borders in Matamoros and Brownsville. And at the conclusion of that meeting, a staff person for the newly elected president of the AFL-CIO, John Sweeney, came up to me and told me that they believed that AFELD had been involved, the American Institute for Free Labor Development had been involved in the events at Ford Coteetland. And I just kind of vaguely thought that was related to the CIA and he said, yes, it was. Um, over the years, I heard from another very good source that AFELD had been involved in the events there. And when I retired in 2016, I determined that I was going to research this and find out what happened in that. Because from my view of that, there was a golden opportunity to build solidarity with the Mexican workers. I mean, you know, people my age lived through a massive deindustrialization and deunionization of the country as work transferred to Mexico. And the only thing that could have made any difference in that was to help the Mexicans raise their wages and benefits. And we missed an opportunity there. So that was really my interest in this. So I found out that the AFL-CIO had control over the AFL archives. And I knew two people who were working on the staff of the National AFL-CIO, who I knew were sympathetic to my views on this. And they did start out helping me. They organized a meeting with the International Affairs Director, uh, Kathy Feingold, about what was the procedure I should follow to gain access to the archives. And they told me what I needed to do. And so I wrote her a letter and uh, wrote one to the George Meany Memorial Archives at the University of Maryland, which was where those archives are at. Um, I got an email back from Kathy Feingold saying they were working with uh, the University of Maryland and um, she would get back to me and thank you for my interest. Last thing I ever heard from anybody in the national AFL-CIO. Um, my friend, I, you know, after a few weeks of nobody responding and nothing happening, I said, I, I think something's wrong here. Is this a big controversy or what am I getting into here? And my friend said, oh, no, this is not controversial. Everybody knows here the CIA was involved with labor. That was the last email I ever got from him. And I never, never got another email about anything. But anyway, he had told me, well, you just have to be patient. So I, OK, I'll be patient. I can do that. I had heard the UAW had archives and files on this from a very good source. And I had just retired from the UAW. So I really believed that that would be much easier to get access to those files. So I started out sending an email to um, Dennis Williams, who he was the president. He, I knew him, he had hired me for the international staff in 2006. Um, didn't get a response from him. Another email, no response. So not that unusual for Dennis Williams. So I drove to Illinois and met with the region four director and told him what I was doing and that I wanted to get the UAW's files on what happened there at Ford Cotitlan. He said he was gonna be seeing Dennis in a few weeks and he would talk to him and get back to me. And I worked for that guy for five years and that was the only time he ever told me he would get back to me and he never did. So I said, okay, well, I know how this is gonna go now. So I wrote a letter to Williams claiming I had a, con a right under the UAW constitution to, to see those files and minutes from the International Executive Board concerning this. Um, no answer. So, uh, you know, are you, under the UAW constitution, you wait 30 days, nothing happens, you can appeal it to the next level. So I appealed it through three levels, you know, over about six months, nobody ever answered one certified letter. I sent him on this. And finally, I got to the UAW Public Review Board, the Ethics Committee of the UAW. And they said, well, you know, we're an appellant body, but if nobody has had a hearing on this, we will have a hearing. And they notified the president's office of that. So two days later, I did get contacted by somebody I knew at the president's office. And um, he really didn't know what was going on. Nobody gave him any background about this. And he did really make an effort to help me track down these files. And he, start, he, he got somebody's laptop and started searching through it. At that point, somebody contacted me and told me where the files were. They were at the uh, Ruther Library at Wayne State University and two nodes, one's the Bieber node and the other in the International Affairs Department node. So I got an index for the Ruther Library and 
did a search for Mexico, the International Affairs Department files for those years are closed for the UAW as they are for the AFL-CIO. But I did get find the Bieber node and I found 12 different files where I thought there might be interesting information or relevant information about this. And one of the files was called the American Institute for Free Labor Development. So I had a friend in Detroit who got a master's degree at Wayne State go look through these files so I didn't have to make the trip. And he took photographs of them. The only real, he found some great stuff. The only real problem was the file called American Institute for Free Labor Development had nothing in it concerning American Institute for Free Labor Development. Had information from AFL CIO speeches and Alaskan oil exports, which were the two folders next to it. So it was obvious to me someone had taken all the AFL material out and then replaced it with the files next next to it. So they, when they turned the box back, it wouldn't be empty. So I contacted the library director and tried to get them to figure out what had happened here. And he finally told me that, well, this had just been a mistake. There had never been an American Institute for Free Labor Development file. It was just a mistake by their PhD archivists when they were organizing this stuff. Well, I, I don't think anybody believed that. I certainly didn't believe that. And I later found documents that proved Owen Bieber was on the board of directors of the American Institute for Free Labor Development. So at a bare minimum, he would have got newsletters, financial reports, and maybe much more, who knows? That's what I believe that was in that file. But when that disappeared, I, I guess I wasn't that surprised because I knew there were a lot of people who didn't want that material found. What surprised me was how willing the archives were to cover that up. They changed the name within a few days to AFL-CIO speeches and um, Alaskan oil exports. Scratch it, took off the name American Institute of Free Labor Development and put a new name on it. So I, again, at that point, at least I knew that there was something there that people were hiding. Uh, there was something going on here that I couldn't explain, but there was, there was something to be found. So I just, uh, I'm more determined to keep researching this. Now, that summer I sent Kathy Feingold a long summary about everything I'd learned and really was trying to cooperate them. I thought they'd be interested in what I could find out. I didn't get an answer from her, but I did get one from the archivist at the George Mini Memorial Archives saying that they had been working with the AFL-CIO to try to open the AFL files and they hoped that they would soon be able to do that. So then I realized it wasn't the holdup for this wasn't the archives or the University of Maryland. I was being blocked from seeing this by the AFL-CIO. So it only took me about a year to figure that out, but that was in fact what was happening. So when I, when I found that, I got some people, I'm retired, was no longer a delegate to labor bodies, but I got some people who were interested in the issue and we started submitting resolutions at labor bodies. And um, one of those passed uh, in Duluth. Uh, in St. Paul, I'd been on that board for a long time and I met with the president and, and he said, well, I have to be against your resolution. I've been told that the, the national, the Trumpka, Richard Trumpka is against us passing that resolution for three reasons. One is it's too much bad publicity for unions. Now, yeah, okay, um, it, it might be good for him. He was up for election that fall and he thought it would be bad for his election. And three, that they believed that the CIA had been involved and they might have had, they approved it. And meaning Afeld, I guess, uh, but they thought they might have legal liability. So they, it didn't pass, uh, but that, that president who I met with, who I'd known for a long time, asked me to hold off on everything for a month. And out of respect for him, I did. And they just used that month. So they were ready in November to vote down the resolution, which they did. I mean, uh, the national affiliates had contacted their people and uh, they came up with the votes to, to kill the resolution. So all it was was a resolution about opening the AFL archives to researchers and union members. You know, it wouldn't have made that big a difference, but they were willing to fight it to that degree. So, I mean, these are just a couple of examples in his leaflet. Uh, Frank used the word banned. Well, no one has come out and said, don't read this, but 
they don't want anything said about this. And I've got maybe 10 or 15 staff people and union officers that I've known and been friends with and now have completely stopped communicating with me. Um, the retirees have been very helpful, but the, the employed staff people have obviously been told they have nothing to do with this. So when I started this project, I really believe that some crack academic had written a book about AFELD and defined its exact relationship to the CIA and to the labor movement. I also believe that the AFL-CIO at some point had acknowledged what had happened in the Cold War and come to terms with it and moved on. Both of those things are completely untrue. The AFL-CIO has been dealing with this issue, the leadership of CIA involvement in the Federation for 50 years by ignoring it. Uh, and they ignore it long enough and hard enough and it goes away and they don't have to deal with it. And as I write about it quite a bit in the book, it has caused some serious problems. And that legacy is still with us today. And it's really hard to think about how labor is gonna move forward when it's not willing to address these kind of issues. Uh, you know, major mistakes, major problems still hanging around. And the, if we just keep sweeping it under the carpet and pretending like it didn't happen, it's going to be very hard to move forward. Uh, labor really needs to seize the ethical high ground and deal with this problem. And so I, I just want to read, make sure I got that. I, that's pretty much about that. But about what, what, what happened at Quatitlan, I just want to read what I wrote in the book about it. This is a, a, the shortest version of what I think happened there. That it was a CIA-sponsored attack on a workers' movement because it was led by a leftist political party, the Revolutionary Workers' Party. The leadership of at Fort Kutitlan were members or supporters of the Revolutionary Park Workers' Party. The CIA was very well aware of that, and they'd been keeping an eye on them for many years. And they were very close to winning these important positions in the CTM, in the National Ford CTM. And the situation there had been developing for years, um, in 1987, the economy was really bad and the CTM agreed with Ford to a, a strike where Ford paid half the pay. It was really a layoff. But after four months, they negated the contract. They were able under Mexican law to get rid of the contract. And then the new contract, they were able to impose a 40% wage and benefit cut. So that was 1987. So there had been a lot of things going on. And, and this plant before what erupted in January 8th um, of 1990. So I, at this point, I guess, uh, can I turn it over to questions? I, you know, I can keep on going, but I really need <laughs> <the> questions. <laughs> okay, Rob, uh, maybe you should put, can you hold up a, a cover of your book so people can see your book? You got one around? Yep, here we go, there we go. Uh, that's that's Rob's book. Hold steady. El Golpe, U.S. Labor, the CIA, and the Coup at Ford in Mexico. It's by Rob McKenzie, assisted by Patrick Dunn. Want to want to emphasize it, everybody? I think it's a, a a very important book, and encourage you to get it. If you sign up with Pluto Press for their newsletter, you can get it for fifty percent off. So. I encourage you to look at it and and uh, uh, talk about uh, and and see what you think when you read that have time to think about it things like that. So we're going to open it up with for questions. While we're going to do this, is if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you should have a thing called reactions, a, a button on reactions. Uh, if you want to speak, so you click on that and it'll say raise hand. So you want to raise your hand and I will call on you in order. Uh, we'll allow everybody to speak that we have time for. I'd like everybody to keep your, um, uh, keep your question. I, one, I'd like you, I'd prefer you to uh, ask questions rather than make statements, but you'll have two minutes and then we're gonna go to the next person so we can get as many people uh, who wants to speak uh, and ask Rob questions, things like that. Excellent uh, presentation. I uh, really learned a lot. Um, 
Rob, uh, who was the um, who was uh, the uh, AFL CIO uh, president at that time, and uh, who was the head of AFL LD? Uh, this you're talking about 1990 or Darn El Gope, Darn the yeah, the... Um, Lane Kirkland, and uh, the head of uh, AFL was William Doherty Jr. He was the yeah. head of that organization from 1965 till it disbanded in 1996. So I spent a lot of time researching William Doherty Jr. I figured out if I could figure out who he was, I could figure out what AFELD was. Because uh, to be honest with you, there's no clear explanation of exactly what it was. There's no question in my mind that Doherty was a career CIA agent. As uh, Phil Agee told Fred Hirsch in 1974 that Doherty was CIA with pension benefits and tenure. Wow. And, you know, honestly, I have a lot of questions about Lane Kirkland. I devote a couple pages to his biography. You know, he came from an arch Confederate family. His great great grandfather was a plantation owner and they owned 150 enslaved people. He joined the Confederate cavalry, died in battle. His great-grandfather, his maternal great-grandfather, um, signed the Articles of Secession, was a signer of the Articles of Secession. Um, Lane's father was a cotton broker, which used to be called a cotton factor during antebellum times. And part of their job was buying and selling slaves for the plantation owners. Now, he went bankrupt during the Depression. Lane went to live with an uncle who was a manager at a textile mill seriously anti-union, bragged about how much he hated unions. The young Lane joined the Merchant Marine. He went to a two-year training program, was a deck officer. As soon as he got out, he went to work for the Navy in Washington and then went to Georgetown, which I also wrote a lot about as a training area for intelligence agents, still is. From when he graduated there, he went straight to the AFL-CIO. So that's his history. It's very interesting. And um, uh, when you said, uh, uh, what's his name? The ambassador was... Um, Negroponte, John D. Negroponte. Like, yes, because he was ambassador in Honduras at the time of uh, yeah, the U.S. Exactly. You know, invasion of Nicaragua. So this is before, this is early 80s now he was... Uh, well, so Negroponte, because that's very interesting. So... Uh, yeah, Negroponte was in Honduras with also... Yeah, the dep guy who became the deputy ambassador, deputy chief of mission, they were both in Honduras helping the Contras. I mean, the, the Congress had said, you cannot fund the Contras. They were figuring out ways to fund the Contras. That's what they were doing in Honduras. In 1988, there was a tumultuous election in Mexico, which is mentioned in the film. Cuauhtémoc yeah. Cardenas almost won, and he had socialists and communists in his coalition. Within weeks of that election, Negroponte and Pastorino were both sent to Mexico. So they were the ambassador during what happened there at Ford. And I think it happened at a couple other plants. I think they were very involved in trying to get Mexico under control. I got a bunch of um, embassy cables from the Freedom of Information Act. When they, of course, they've got, and that's Negroponte's name is on most of those. And he became director of national intelligence later on. Right. Norm, can we can, you, can can I ask you a hold up so we can get some other people in the conversation, please? Yeah, you see, when you find one of these topics, I, I can go on a long time. You need to cut me off. <laughs> okay, uh, Steve Zeltzer, please. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think this is a very important book, and every trade unit, every UAW member should read it to learn about the this, the history of our brothers and sisters in Mexico in labor and what happened to them. Um, the, one of the things uh, maybe you can address is the transformation from the AIFLD to the, the uh, Solidarity Center and whether or not they operate in the same way, because that's, uh, you know, they, you know they, they're still getting money from the US government through the National Endowment for Democracy. And um, also, um, what response you've had from the, the new UAW leadership, if any, about what they're going to do about it, because the UAW is an important component of the AFL-CIO in 
uh, it's in, you know, and what it does internationally. So what do you see, how do you see taking that up within the UAW in this new development? That's it. So there's two questions. Somebody's got to cut me off if I go on too long. On, um, <laughs> on the Solidarity Center, I had decided when I started researching that I was not going to get into the Solidarity Center. I mean, it's a huge agency, lots of money, wonderful records. And, you know, I, I, during the Obama years, I saw them doing things that I thought were pretty decent things. But then as I did this research, I came across some original research about how it got started. And um, one of those things was an interview with William Doherty Jr. And just before he retired, when he talked about what AFELD was going to be shut down and what we need in the future was an organization that works around um, trade and human rights. And that's what we need to promote unions under capitalism. He even called it neoliberalism and kind of laid out what appears to me to be the theoretical basis of what became the Solidarity Center. And then I also had another interview with a guy, Paul Samoji, probably hint, nobody here knows his name. He was very active with the, the AFEL groups. And uh, some of the people on the staff at the time told me they believed he was CIA faction. Anyway, he told me that the Solidarity Center was a Kirkland Donahue initiative. I always thought it was something Sweeney came up with. It had been started before Sweeney came in. So mm -hmm. it's pretty clear to me it was a transition as the Cold War ended and wound down, Solidarity Center was a transition to uh, the, the new international landscape. Now, I will say the, land, uh, the Solidarity Center is spending a lot of money in Mexico helping these independent unions. And I support that. I, I think they, that money is needed and I actually support what they're doing. And I'm, I've got a, a unilateral ceasefire in the Solidarity Center for the time being. Now, I know there's somebody on here who knows a lot more about the Solidarity Center than I do, but uh, that's all I'll say. Now, the question is that the UAW, the new leadership, I mean, they have really got their hands full right now. I mean, they are really making some huge changes to the union, to the staff, much more than I thought was possible. And then they've got these auto contracts up, which are really going to be difficult. So I'm not going to bug them about this until the contracts get settled. But I will ask them to open the International Affairs Department files for the 1980s, because there's going to be a lot of stuff in there. I found stuff in the Bieber node, which is just kind of left over from what will be in the archives if they don't disappear. So on the issues of worker solidarity, uh, you know, if I had some, we had some concrete proposals uh, about what we could do, I would certainly back those because, uh, you know, the people I know, the UAWD people are very supportive in general of that concept. Is that okay. right? Uh, all right, thanks, Rob. All right, let's go to uh, Leslie. You can unmute Leslie. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, this, this may sound like a very old fashioned and stupid question, but I learned to my surprise recently uh, from a, a, when we were on a, a Mexico Solidarity Project call that there are if I heard right, five labor attaches at the US embassy in Mexico. And I'm thinking, what are all these people doing and can they be trusted? Uh, and one thing that immediately came to my mind, again, this is from many, many, many years ago when I was a kid uh, and my, I was overseas with my family because my father worked for US embassies in various places. And there was always, some relatively obscure attache at the embassy who was actually CIA. It was usually a pretty open secret, but um, uh, that was the first thing that came to my mind. I mean, I remember when we were in Sri Lanka and, and the legal attache at the embassy, like, what was he doing? Well, he was CIA. I was madly in love with his son, but that's an ancient story <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, no, I think uh, 
I mean, I, in the in the when I finally did get into the AFL archives on Mexico, and I did find a lot of things where a, people would approach AFL like it was a government agency because everybody knew it was, and they they that was part of the reason they really tried to build up these labor attaches so they would have some other avenue for these groups to contact. And yeah, I, you know, the embassy people, I mean, Phil Agee said in 1968, there were 15 people working in the US embassy in Mexico for the CIA under cover of the State Department. So uh, that that's a pretty common cover for CIA agents. Certainly doesn't mean everybody is, but certainly that, that is well used. I, you know, okay. I don't, I, I, I did see a few interviews and stuff with people who were labor attaches. Apparently they let the AFL CIO get some of their people into those jobs, but it's not anything I really studied, the labor attache or the State Department. Leslie, I'm sorry. What, I, what, what do they do? I mean, what's their job? See, I couldn't give you a really good answer. Okay. And I don't want to. No, no. Okay. Uh, gotcha. No. Leslie, I think to, to give you a little more information on that, uh, I believe, I know they used to, I don't know if they still do, but they used to have the, uh, any labor attache had to be approved by the AFL-CIO president. Um, and basically their job is to try to understand what's happening in the labor movement in every country. And that's what they have them in these embassies. Um uh, some may be CIA, some may not. I mean, a lot of this is kept intentionally vague so that researchers uh, can't really hammer that. But, but it's, it's certainly, whether they're CIA or not, they're basically trying to understand the labor movement, trying to understand its, its role in local politics uh, and things such as this. So it's a, it's a very much of an intelligence uh, gathering and analyzing situation of the labor movement. And I believe almost every U.S. embassy has at least one labor attache. Your point about five being in Mexico is very interesting. I don't think we know yet what they're doing in Mexico. We know they've thrown a lot of money. This is something that Lapayo wants, uh, wants to look at in more detail um but it's very, it is very questionable so we don't know so thank you for your question is there someone else that would like to ask rob a question frank had his hand up oh okay frank you want to you got something to say yeah um so um anyway i i do believe this book is very very important and that uaw membership should have access to it to read it uh, and I appreciate Rob uh, your presentation especially about the work that was done at Ford's in St. Paul uh, I think that uh, there's a lot to be learned there by the current uh, rank and file movement and it's partly why I thought it would be really important to share this so one of the things I think that can be done uh, as a way of beginning to make inroads is to uh, have the UAW uh, commemorate the brother, and I'm sorry I don't have his name. I thought I'd written it down. Um, Clayton Nemo. Clayton, right? Clayton Nemo, yeah. Clayton Nemo. Yeah. That we should uh, uh, urge uh, the new leadership, the UAW, to set uh, January 8th as a commemoration, as a way of getting out his story and all the ramifications. And that would include a lot of, a lot of information that otherwise U.S. workers don't know. And uh, so I think that would be a very simple thing. Um, I think that the, the, the complications in the current efforts in solidarity with Mexican workers, especially uh, as taken up at the Solidarity Center and now being taken up at UAWD is, you know, full of landmines uh, because we always say, uh, follow the money. And we know that uh, Afield uh, in 1983 
uh, began to get its funding from the National Endowment for Democracy. And even though Afield uh, was eventually closed in 1996, and the Solidarity Center took its place, the NED money has not, it was never interrupted. And the fact that we learned that NED money is to the tune of 75 million is helping to fund the efforts today is what makes it full of landmines. And I think it's very critical for UAW members who wish to support Mexican workers because it's in the interest of Mexican workers and US workers that they be uh, eyes open to understanding what the uh, battlefield looks like. And But I think uh, I agree with Rob that we should do everything possible to encourage the UAW to begin to be an inter have a, a rank and file internationalist character by supporting our brothers and sisters in the auto industry and other and elsewhere in Mexico. Thank you. Great. All right. Thanks, Frank. All right, Bruce Allen has his hand up. Uh, Bruce, would you unmute? Sure. Uh, what I want to ask is slightly off topic, but I think completely relevant to uh, Brother Mackenzie. I would like to ask you in your research about the AFL-CIO in relation to Mexico and possibly some involvement by the CIA, what, uh, you, if anything, you found with respect to the role the, the AFL-CIO played in the Coalition for Justice in the Maquila Doras in the 1990s. I was deeply involved in that organization. I was on its executive and I attended most of its conferences. And my opinion always has been based on my experiences in, in the Coalition for Justice and the Maquila Doors was that the AFL CIO sabotaged that organization and led to its eventual demise. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested to know whether you ever came across any information uh, that in any way corroborates my suspicions. Uh, they, the, and I think they might have been particularly concerned about the fact that the Coalition for Justice and the Quiladores had a pretty good relationship with the Zapatistas in Mexico. In fact, Zapatistas and Zap Zapatista representatives attended some of the uh, trinational meetings the coalition had in uh, the Quiladores. Well, that's okay. an interesting question. I, I don't have the answer to that, but... Um... You, you might be on to something there. I mean, the, the AFL CIO funded the, the CJM in its early time, but I know uh, Judy Ansel was very involved in it and had some concerns about some of the labor oriented people at various times who were involved there. So I don't think I really know enough to venture in there, but uh, you might be on to something there. My opinion is that they effectively pulled out of it and pulled their support from it. And uh, in effect, the effect of that was that it led to a wither, uh, downward spiral and withering of the organization. And I believe that that happened because, and this is just my opinion, I believe that that happened because they were not uh, pleased with the, the the political content of the work of the Coalition for Justice in the Maquila Doris. Yeah, the Zapatista Rising was 94, right? Yeah, yes, January yeah. 1994. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and the coalition was still having trinational meetings through the mid 90s up to uh, 98, which is the last time I participated in one. And I really believe that the AFL CIO was instrumental in the uh, eventual demise of that organization but that's that you know i can't i can't corroborate that in any in any way with actual evidence that that was just my my definite impression from my involvement in the organization and, and why this afl cio staff person approached me and told me that afeld had been involved i i do not have an explanation of why he did that I mean, at the time, I just thought, well, they're just really enthusiastic and about what happened there. And But, you know, when you get to that kind of level in labor movement, people just don't walk around talking about secrets unless there's an agenda. They've been told to do it for some reason. I, I'm just not clear 
what those reasons were. But he um, was right. They, they were involved. I did find documents. That in the, that in the earlier that. years of the coalition, the coalition was very, very uh, advantageous for the AFL-CIO because it played a very uh, important role in, in the fight against the North American Free Trade Agreement. And uh, it really, it really provided some, uh, uh, you know, foot soldiers to uh, do work in, on the ground in uh, the Maquiladora zone. And it also uh, did some effective lobbying in Congress to try and stop the, uh, coal, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement from getting passed. Fascinating line of line of conversation. Obviously, something we should keep on in mind. Uh, uh, anybody else? All right, I see Steve Zelter. Since nobody else wants to speak, I'll let Steve speak for a second time. Steve. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, obviously uh, this is a, a live question still in the labor movement, and the fact that um, well. The, the United States government with the Solidarity Center are spending upwards of $300 million in Mexico for labor work, <laughs> whatever that is, is a significant and unknown actually by people in the United States. I mean, the NLRB only gets $274 million a year and they're spending $300 million in Mexico for labor operations. Raise a, a question that needs to be investigated. But the other question is um, the uh, what's happening now in negotiations, because the fact of the matter is a successful struggle of the auto workers in the United States is is connected directly to what's happening in Mexico. Large now, uh, amount of production is done in Mexico, not only assembly plants, but parts plants. And the need for unity between uh, auto workers in Mexico and the United States is critical, and also uh, including organizing these other plants in the South, which are non-union, non-UAW. So I think that um, the question of organizing uh, trilaterally, Mexico, Canadian, U.S., um, and uh, having real unionism uh, with the workers in Mexico is, is very important. And I, I don't really know if it's being addressed by or any plans by the UAW, even the new UAW leadership, about any kind of collaboration with the uh, with the Mexican workers, um, as far as direct links and direct solidarity action of U.S. workers. I mean, when when Rob, you went down there with other UAW uh, members. I mean, your intent was not only to help them, but to build real solidarity between your struggle and the struggle of the Ford workers. And I think that has to really be. That's the focus, you know, that we want to really build direct links and direct solidarity between workers, particularly who work for the same company. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else would like to speak? Steve, if you'd lower your hand, please. Yeah. Um, uh, Kim? Yeah, Frank. Yeah, let me, let me, I put a, a, a link in the chat uh, to a number of, uh, uh, different links uh, that will be good follow up to our presentation today. And I included there's the Detroiters are having a celebration on May Day. Um, and there's more information there for anybody that has friends in Detroit that would urge them to join. Um, but anyway, you'll find uh, items useful include including Rob's website, uh, an article in Covert uh, Action Magazine and so on. So I just urge you to go to the link. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Steve, could you put up the Lapayo uh, URL? Oh, uh, that's included. I have that on the announcement. Oh, okay. Thanks, Frank. Yeah. Uh, this will also, this, this program is being re recorded and it will be put up on the Lapayo website. So if you know people that might be interested, please uh, direct them to that so they can they can come and watch this whole interaction, this whole program. I would point out, uh, I would take a moment of personal privilege here. Um, I published a book years ago that's still around. It's called The AFL-CIO Secret War Against Developing Country Workers, Solidarity or Sabotage. Now it's been out for years. It's in paperback, so you probably can pick it up at a you know at a pretty decent price. Uh, but 
What I do in this is I talk about their international operations over the last hundred years. And I'm sort of sketching things out and different parts have been uh, supported. Uh, we still, there's a lot we don't know. They don't want us to know about this, but this work and then under, uh, under my name, if you Google my name, my last name, which is Sipes, S-C-I-P-E-S, You'll see links to, to my publications page where I have a section on this. There's And we'll put this all eventually on the LaPaio website, but uh, I've been a little busy, so I haven't gotten, gotten this stuff updated. So there's a lot of information out there. Uh, it continues to be, people continue working on this. I know Jeff Shirky's got a book coming out next year on the AFL-CIO's foreign policy. So hopefully we're gathering more and more work. We're trying to understand what they're doing. Um, there was a there was some talk about uh, the Solidarity Center. Uh, it seems to be a more more sophisticated operation than A Field or or A Field's uh, sister components in Asia and Africa. The Solidarity Center in some places has been helpful to local unionists. Uh, other times it's very questionable. So we can't paint them with one, one just broad brush. We have to be a little more nuanced and look at this uh, in, in a more sophisticated manner. But in all things, uh, all things with the AFL-CIO foreign operations, we have to be critical. We can't take their propaganda at face value in that. And I include the Solidarity Center's website. They're operating in, in 60 different countries around the world, and we don't know why they're in there in these countries. We don't know why they're in the particular countries. We don't know who they're working with. They have never given an honest report about AFL-CIO operations around the world. Um, so there's a lot still be to be learned. Rod, uh, before we started, uh, you had, uh, uh, Rob had said that you had been involved in this in the local in 879 do you want to say anything about this no. or whatever you, you have to unmute yourself if you would i i'm still here kim i just lost oh. my screen i clicked on a link in the chat and now i can't get my yeah. video back. okay i'm, I'm glad you here. i just that asked rod hayworth yeah, yeah i heard you i heard you comments. <laughs> uh well it's been about uh what 30, 30 plus years, I guess, uh, yeah. for me. And, and uh, you know, I had a conversation with Rob the other day um, and, it, and watching the $4 a day video really brought back a lot of memories. Um, I, I think at, at that time, um, I had just been elected as a vice president and, and I had 20 years in a Ford plant, mostly on the assembly line and had not been involved in union activities at all to that point. Mm. Um, and I, I took a college class. Um, I was working on my degree and uh, it was on unions held in the union hall. And uh, after the class, it was uh, the, like the light went on and I said, oh, that's, that's pretty amazing. And that's something I think I'd like to be involved in. Um, so I got elected and uh, it wasn't very long uh, before I became involved in this issue. And it, it was uh, looking back and listening to the to uh, really how deep some of the stuff went. I'm surprised some of us didn't get assassinated or held hostage in Mexico. I mean, <laughs> real world. We were yeah. we were in the mix. Yeah. Like you saw Ted, uh, Ted Lavalle and Barb DeGroat from our local right there with the workers. And uh, knowing knowing what I know now, uh, I, I don't know if I'd have been that brave to tell you the truth. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, I mean, I, I was new and naive and, and happened to uh, pair up with some really good people, including Rob. And uh, this was an issue that it really wasn't hard to get behind right out of the chute. And it was astounding to me that more you know mainstream uh other locals and and the state afl cio was was so adamantly against supporting the mexican workers uh that um that uh large uh, ceremony in our plant i can remember walking in and and 
you know, I was working on that, that issue of when Ted gave that speech and the, the, our regional director at that time walked in and, and I don't know, one of us asked him about, you know, opposing NAFTA and so on. And, you know, his, his response was so typical. He said, screw the Mexicans are taking our jobs. And that was it. Um, so, you know, it was kind of an uphill battle, but what was surprising to me was in, and, and Rob probably would remember more than I, I did, but it was after we got those workers into the state AFL-CIO convention, which again, you know, I, I thought was just a natural thing to do and couldn't understand the opposition, but um, it wasn't all that long after that, that the state president really did, uh, you know, as somewhat of a turnaround, uh, at least in being anti-NAFTA. Um, and I, I was trying to think because there was, there was a lot of momentum being built around solidarity with, uh, you know, with the Ford workers and anti-NAFTA opposition. And I, I guess I couldn't understand when Clinton was elected why in the world he pulled the carpet off from underneath us. Uh, it was just like that. And from what I remember again, you know, 30 years ago, uh, I mean, we had the votes to defeat it. And Clinton basically behind the scenes undid everything that was done. And, yeah. uh, you know, I really felt at that time that a lot of the momentum we had was lost. Um, because that was certainly one of, one of the big fights without, without that, uh, you know, uh, we were really left to, uh, we didn't have a, a heck of a lot of leverage to, uh, continue to build that movement when the president of the United States pulled the carpet out. So, uh, but very exciting time. And, and, you know, as you saw in the video, being down there with those people, um, I mean, their intensity and their commitment, you, you just couldn't help but, but catch that and, and want to be a part of it. Uh, so it was an amazing time, really. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, uh, we're about out of time. Let's give it, uh, first of all, I want to say thanks to Rob McKenzie, an excellent presentation. I hope everybody's gotten good stuff out of it. I hope you'll read his book. The book is worth it. It's by Pluto Press. Uh, again, if you sign up for Pluto's uh, newsletter, you get a 50% discount. Hell, you can't beat that. And uh, it's worth thinking about and talking to your neighbors. Please share uh, the LaPaya website with people. Uh, so check it out. And Rob, uh, why don't you sort of close us out with any final words or whatever? Well, uh, thanks to you guys for having me. And uh, this is, as everyone says, an ongoing issue. And I, I think when you're looking at history, I thought, well, this was 30 years ago. This was a, you know, old, old, dead, quiet area of academic inquiry. I was completely wrong about that. I mean, this is just as hot as if it just happened yesterday, because so much has gone unaddressed in labor. And I hope we're able to make some progress on building international worker solidarity. All right. Folks, the, the excellent uh, way to end this. Thank you very much for your time, your attention. Please pass the word. We're hoping to have another uh, video uh, with tentatively looking at June 24th. Uh, hopefully everybody uh, sent in your, your email address so we can let you know. If you found this worthwhile, we'd appreciate letting you know, especially if you tell us the strengths or any weaknesses of the program. We want to improve our programming. Uh, we, we will continue this. We will continue this work because, as, as Rob said, we need to build global labor solidarity. Thank you all. It's been a great day. Hope you had a, hope you learned a lot. Thank you very much and solidarity forever. <laughs>